are not fighting progress. We are making it. We are not dealing with a vanishing wilderness. We are working for a wilderness forever. Howard Zonheiser. Welcome to Voices of the Wilderness. I'm Jeff Ryan. When I started this series about America's conservation giants, I had never even heard the name Howard Zonheiser. Little did I know that he played such an important role in preserving America's wilderness. The year was 1945. World War II was winding toward an ending. America was emerging from the great struggle and on the threshold of a period of great prosperity. Yet, in Washington, D.C., a decade-old organization called the Wilderness Society was facing tremendous uncertainty. The Society's mission was never in doubt. The Founders' dedication to preserving and protecting the country's wild lands was steadfast as ever. The question was, who would guide them into their second decade and beyond? The Wilderness Society's first and only president and editor of the organization's magazine, Robert Sterling Yard, passed away in April 1945 at age 84. Only three years after the Society was founded in 1935, another of the founding eight members, the seemingly invincible Bob Marshall, had died in his sleep on a train bound from D.C. to New York City at age 37. Of the six remaining founders, the two best suited to the job were least able to give up what they were doing. Ernest Oberholzer was living in the wilds of Minnesota on Mallard Island, waging an effort to preserve what would later become known as the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Living on his remote island, he orchestrated the successful campaign to preserve much of the Quetico Superior Lake area. Aldo Leopold was living in Baraboo, Wisconsin, where he and his family had restored a shack, were experimenting with prairie restoration, and where Leopold would find inspiration for developing his land ethic and his influential book of essays, A Sand County Almanac. Two of the other founding members were also too busy to take on the role of president. Bernard Frank was active in four other conservation associations. Harvey Broom was pouring most of his efforts into protecting the Great Smoky Mountains near his Tennessee home and would become the Wilderness Society president in good time. Thus, 66-year-old Benton Mackay, the man who came up with the idea for the Appalachian Trail in 1921, became the second president of the Wilderness Society in 1945, a job he would hold for the next five years. Benton Mackay was a prolific writer and idea man, but unlike his predecessor, Robert Sterling Yard, who had been hired to be the first publicist for the National Park Service, Mackay's writing style was conducive to creating scholarly books and treatises, not spearheading and editing a quarterly publication. Because the Living Wilderness magazine was critical to the society's visibility and growth, they needed to hire a talented writer to take over the job. Enter Howard Zonheiser, who had earned a reputation around Washington, D.C. as a hard-working researcher, editor, and writer. Where does Zonny discover his love for nature? To find out, we need to take a brief trip back to the early 1900s. Howard Zonheiser was born in Franklin, Pennsylvania in 1906. The Zonheiser family moved several times over Howard's first dozen years as a result of his father's occupation as a free Methodist minister. When Howard was 12, the family settled in Tyanesta, Pennsylvania, which instilled a wonder for nature in the boy, especially after he was fitted with spectacles and could fully appreciate the beauty around him. Jeff Ryan sat down with Howard's son, Edward, who takes the story from here. Tyanesta is a river town on the Allegheny, and uh, much of that area is now part of the Allegheny National Forest, but of course was not when he was a boy there in Tyanesta before the, well, around 1920. Tyanesta was uh, very rural. Um, the surroundings were very rural, so he spent a lot of time in the whoops. <laughs> right. And... Um, he, he really fell in love with the real world once he saw it sharply. And also, one of his elementary school teachers uh, started a Junior Audubon thing. And that's where he became fascinated with birds. And the birds eventually led him in, into uh, the wild. Right. So I guess right. that's that was the impact of Tyanesta 
uh, was just living in an area where there's a lot of wild, still wild country around, even though it, you know it was settled Pennsylvania area. But there was a lot of forests and um, trout streams and things. So when I was a kid, we fished there. The river was really important to him too. I get the impression that he was very excited to uh, show your mother the river. They spent some time, was it at, just after they got married, taking a canoe trip down the river from New York? Yes, they, uh, they got married in 1936. And uh, in 1937, they canoed from Olean, New York, all the way down to Tyanesta. And uh, his journal, that trip, uh, has been published by Friends of Allegheny Wilderness. Um, and uh, on the trip, he kept, you know, notes on all the birds and things. And uh, But he also had Paul Graves' Treasury on the trip, which is a literary collection. So uh, those were his twin influences, really, Right, were the... Natural world and uh, his his pantheon was the Book of Job and Dante and William Blake and Henry Thoreau. Those were his those were his mentors. Right, all great influences. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of literature, uh, your home was floor to ceiling with books, and your father could scarcely pass a bookstore without browsing or buying. Well, he was such a book junkie that in uh, George Friend's bookshop on 9th Street in D.C., every time I went, I, I got a free book because George <laughs> Friend wanted me occupied, you know. Right. He'd say, oh, Edward, uh, he says, I got a book here I think you'll like. And uh, so he would take me over to the shelf and pull it off. It was obviously pre-selected. And... Um, so I would start reading this book, you know, and he said, oh, well, you, you can take it home. You can take it home. <laughs> Just to pacify me so my father could concentrate on buying books. So when, you're, when your dad, who was um, obviously a, a really talented writer, that kept getting better, I think, due to his government jobs and having to continually produce, um, he, he came to a place where... The Wilderness Society asked him to come on board to edit the magazine. When he first got on board, it seemed that Harvey Broom was one of the people who was a little bit wary of this upstart kid and whether he was really going to be able to do what they thought. And as it turned out, he became very good friends with the Brooms. And uh, it seemed to me that he stopped by there quite often when he was in the area, I found that really great that they were able to form such a bond. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, actually, a, a number of the uh, central core of the then Wilderness Society thought that he was not, quote, a wilderness man. And uh, it, one of them even said, he looks more like a librarian. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, there was question about that, but um, he he had a lot of skills that they needed, and he was determined to uh, to fit in. You can tell that from his uh, early writings and things. Well, one so, of his loves too was editing that magazine, wasn't it? I mean, he he really that was a literary standard of of the time was the quality of the writing in that magazine. I take it he was very proud of his work with all of those writers. Yeah, it's amazing. He did that quarterly magazine with his left hand, you know, doing what today there's a big membership department and there's, you know, there's a this department and that department. He was a Washington office initially with a half-time secretary. Right. Um, and um, the magazine was printed in Baltimore, so they would deliver proofs to him at, home, at our home in Hyattsville, Maryland. And then uh, he would go to the printer and put the magazine to bed overnight. And he was uh, so skilled at the space in the magazine that he, 
he was also a last minute writer. And uh, at the printer between galleys, he would handwrite the editorial, and it would usually it would be within a line of fitting the space because mm-hmm. that was you know poured metal lead type days. And uh, later I got to go up there with him overnight a few times, and the uh, the young guys who were printers were always very solicitous <laughs> toward me, and they would always tell me, now you stay in school so you won't end up here, you know. <laughs> and of course at that point I would have rather ended up there than be in school. Right. Because I, I just loved that uh, that whole printing operation. You know? Well, and also he was quite often trying to uh, react to very newsworthy things that were happening and try to squeeze in bulletins and things right before they went to press, right? Yes, and uh, T.H. Watkins told me that he thought my father's greatest contribution to environmental journalism was his news notes section in the back of the magazine, which brought, you know, brought other types of organizations into uh, dialogue with the wilderness movement. Right after your father started working with the society, he proposed that the society annual meetings be held in the remote locations um, and not in DC anymore, which um, I feel was a stroke of genius. And I think um, it really benefited the society, don't you think, to have meetings in areas that inspired them when they were doing business? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, um, there's no question that those those weren't, uh, and they were also uh, great bonding mechanisms because you know when you're out in the <laughs> middle of nowhere right and you, you don't have a cell phone or a TV or a daily newspaper you're you know you're a captive audience for what the real topic is right <laughs> and I, I found it interesting because you know poor Ernest Oberholzer had the longest haul of any of them to try to get to anywhere <laughs> he was successful in having at least one meeting up there and on uh, Rainy Lake, but at some of the letters I was, uh, I felt for him when he said, gee, it's quite a haul for me to get to uh, Moose, Wyoming from uh, from uh, International Falls. <laughs> you can't get there from here. Ober, um, Ober was a real character. In 1956, we made a series of wilderness trips. Uh, my father had a contract with Alfred Knopf Publishers to do a book on wilderness family camping. So we all had to keep journals on these trips. And uh, my father's journal, this I learned years later, stopped partway through the trip because he was having a lot of health problems on the trip that my mother was aware of, but uh, we kids weren't didn't really catch that he was having so many problems. And... Um, I don't know if he, but his his journal just stops, but my mother's kept on. So for her, um, I believe, 80th birthday, my sister and I and uh, my sister's husband uh, made her journals up as a record of that trip, and we used the title that had been supposed to be the title of the book, which was Ways to the Wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is a, a nice record of that trip. The very end of that trip for us was at Rainy Lake in Mallard Island for the council meeting that summer Right for uh, the Wilderness Society. And uh, so that was when I got to experience Oberholzer's Island. Just a few months into his job as executive secretary and editor at the Wilderness Society, Howard Zonheiser attended a wildlife conservation conference in New York. There, he met Paul Schaefer, who was fighting proposed dams on the Moose River within New York's Adirondack State Park. It was Zonny's first foray into wilderness preservation, and what he learned accelerated his trajectory as a wilderness advocate. Later that same year, he took his family camping in the Adirondacks, where he would buy a 25-acre parcel. That's a fabulous story about how your father discovered the Adirondacks by going up to help them preserve the area and ultimately 
was uh, advised that maybe he might want to look at that piece of property. <laughs> Good decision. Yeah. Actually, uh, it was in the Adirondacks in what they call the Black River Wars, which was uh, controversy over dams in the western Adirondacks. It would have flooded a lot of lowland, which were very important winter yarding areas for deer. And some of those dams were already engineered, and everybody said, you can't beat that. But um, my father, because he had worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Biological Survey, was accustomed to going to the uh, North American Wildlife Conference every year. So in 1946, in February, which was just months after he went to work for the Warner Society, he went to the, the North American Wildlife Conference in New York. And there, Paul Schaefer and John Apperson made a uh, presentation about the Western Adirondacks, and uh, Paul Schaefer showed a film about it. <laughs> it was the f first time, I think, uh, moving pictures were used in the conservation uh, controversy. And uh, he invited my father and the family to come up that summer, and that's how they came to the Adirondacks, but uh, my father knew a lot about publicity and all that, but he didn't, he had, didn't have any experience with grassroots organizing, and he and Paul Schaefer went all over the western Adirondacks, <laughs> and actually Schaefer had learned from Apperson, you know, how to uh, wake them up. Right. That was Apperson's motto, we will wake them up. <laughs> so... <clears throat> they trekked all over the Western Adirondacks, and that that was really the training for the Echo Park. Right. And the Echo Park was the training for the Wilderness Act. Five years into his tenure at the Wilderness Society, Howard Zonheiser and others who cared deeply about America's wild and scenic places became increasingly aware of the threats to their existence. When they discovered that even places already designated as national parks or national monuments were endangered, they mounted a campaign to save them before it was too late. In 1949, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation proposed building two dams within Dinosaur National Monument as part of their Upper Colorado River Storage Project. If built, the dams would flood much of Dinosaur National Monument, the creation of Echo Park Dam and the smaller Split Mountain Dam would flood two canyons, destroy dinosaur fossil mounds, and redefine the topography of the entire area. Steamboat Rock, one of the park's iconic features, named by intrepid explorer John Wesley Powell on his way through the region, would retain only one-third of its height above river level after its base was consumed by rising water. In 1952, a man named Harold Bradley traveled down the Yampa River through the proposed dam site with two of his sons and their families. After their week-long trip, they emerged with a few reels of home movies and a newfound dedication to preventing the Echo Park Dam from being built. The Bradley family had known the legendary wilderness disciple John Muir and were familiar with his unsuccessful battle to prevent the Hetch Hetchy Dam from being built within Yosemite National Park in the early 1900s. Bradley feared that if the Echo Park Dam was built, nothing would prevent other dams from being built in other national parks and monuments. Bradley began showing his movie footage to audiences throughout the western United States. One attendee was David Brower, the executive director of the Sierra Club. Opposition to the dam project quickly gained speed as Brower created what his son Kenneth described as the prototypic conservation campaign. David Brower organized river trips through the park as a means to get people to see what would forever be lost. The publisher, Alfred A. Knopf, commissioned a book of photographs and essays to be edited by the Dean of Western Writers, Wallace Stegner. Brower commissioned a documentary film by Charles Eggett, highlighting the grandeur and historical value of Dinosaur Monument. Brower also mounted PR and lobbying campaigns aimed at decision makers in Washington, D.C. David Brower's chief ally in Washington was Howard Zahnheiser. Zahni built a consortium of supporters that included former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and other influential public figures, as well as 17 organizations to oppose the dam. In 
he raised enough money to create a pamphlet entitled Don't Damn the National Park System, which was distributed nationwide. The powerful partnership and coordinated efforts of Brower and Zonheiser made history. Their campaign to save Echo Park set a new standard for protecting existing public lands. When the Colorado River Storage Project Act became law on April 11, 1956, it stated that no dam or reservoir constructed under the authorization of the act shall be within any national park or monument. In order to defeat the dam project, one concession needed to be made. The U.S. Bureau of Land Reclamation insisted that the environmental groups that opposed the Echo Park Dam would not oppose the construction of the Glen Canyon Dam, which would be built on the Colorado River in northern Arizona. Yet, those who fought to preserve Dinosaur National Monument had accomplished much more than they conceded. They brought national attention to the need to preserve wilderness, galvanized a number of environmental groups in that effort, and set the stage for a sea change in how citizens viewed our public lands. Nobody understood the need to seize the momentum more than Howard Zonizer, who at the time said, Let's make a concerted effort for a positive program that will establish an enduring system of areas where we can be at peace and not forever feel that wilderness is a battlefield. It was more than a sentiment. It would become his life mission. The uh, Wilderness Act was actually launched with an inventory of wilderness areas um, my father got a congressman from Ohio, which is not a big wilderness state, to request from the uh, Legislative Reference Bureau a, an inventory of wilderness and wild areas in the United States. And of course, that was just a ploy to put it into Ernest Griffith's hands. Right, right. <laughs> and they produced a, uh, a, a study that's it's, uh, like a five by seven booklet that's about three quarters of an inch thick, an inventory of wildland areas. And that, that was the first thing that he shopped around Congress right. um, to get the ball rolling. He learned a lot from Ernest Griffith about the, how a bill passes. In fact, we had a diagrammatic book at home on how a bill becomes a law. Wow. <laughs> and so that, that, was, that was a framework. Right. So. Well, the, that ties in with the passage of the Wilderness Act and how his great skill in listening and in sort of imparting the different ways the Wilderness Act was important to various constituencies really amazes me <laughs> that, um, that when the bill went to final vote, there was one ca vote cast against it says, speaks volumes. Yeah, you don't see that today. No, you don't. His father was a minister and made a lot of pastoral calls, and I think a lot of my father's approach toward uh, congressional visits and things were, it was like a pastoral call, and, you know, you never took no for an answer. You'd always come back and see if they were ready for the kingdom. Right, right. <laughs> well, well said. And, you know, I think... There's a, there's a quote that he made, I think, that was really important. One of his greatest contributions, I think, um, is that he made a connection between the wilderness not being a place that we escape to, but a place that we make connection with. And I, I thought that that was a really profound uh, concept to come up with in that space and time. And I think that actually changed the conversation around wilderness. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, he, he thought that we're all part of the wildness of the universe, and uh, and he didn't see separation. And, and he was a quick study of people like Aldo Leopold, whom he greatly admired. Leopold had a, uh, a great sense of the grand scheme of things, and that uh, the whole idea of the land ethic of drawing the entire biota into, uh, even into the legal ethos, that that's such a leap forward, and uh, so he he was he learned a lot from the people around. Him. Right, right. <laughs> and I uh, 
worked for the Wilderness Society for a time doing some filing work. They had like years of correspondence <laughs> stacked up on top of the file cabinets. And since I knew the names of a lot of people and some of the issues and things, uh, I could, you know, I knew where to file those things. So right. I did that for a long time, which was very educational about wilderness and, you know, just the thousands of letters that people wrote. These people in the Wilderness Society, they wrote these very thoughtful, careful, two- and three-page, single-space letters back and forth, and mm -hmm. all that stuff exists still. Right. You know, and it's a huge source material. They, they were caring for the wilderness, obviously. They, they cared very deeply about their mission. But what really comes across in those letters to me is how much they cared about each other. <laughs> um, you know, they were, they were very, almost every letter ends with say hello to your wife and kids or we hope you, we get to see you next Christmas or whatever. And it's a wonderful aspect of that time period and, and that organization, I think. Yeah, you mentioned the brooms and my father's attention to them. Um, they had no children, so uh, we, and we had no grandfather. By, by the time I was born, uh, both of my grandfathers were, were actually long dead. And so um, Harvey and Ann became grandpa and grandma. Right. <laughs> So, and yeah, and we would visit them down in uh, Tennessee, and they at that point they had a cabin in Cobbles Hollow that was later became part of the Smokies Park when it was expanded. Right. And uh, so we, we spent, yeah, we spent time with them both in Washington and in Tennessee. So, and they were great, gentle people. From the outset, Howard Zahnheiser expected pushback against the Wilderness Act because various agencies feared that the new law would adversely affect their management of existing lands. Mining, timber, and petroleum interests had their own objections. But Zahnheiser soldiered on, often putting in 20-hour days as he slowly built federal agency and bipartisan congressional support. Your father's faith must have played a role in um, overcoming despair during that long, long march because they went through, I think he went to something like 19 hearings and or more and um, had all these iterations of the act and <clears throat> there was a lot of discouragement or potential discouragement along the way. What do you think bolstered him? Well, again, it was the kind of pastoral view of what was going on. You know, in religion, there's a sense of the eschaton, the end times, <laughs> you know, so... But so. he kept soldiering on with, yeah. with his multi-pocketed, uh, he had a special jacket designed with pockets sewn inside. Yeah, in uh, Georgetown, which wasn't at all like Georgetown, the part of Georgetown part of Washington, D.C. today, but it, there was a uh, tailor named E. Si Silas, really cool guy. And so he, he made these jackets for my father that had big pockets inside them. And uh, when I was young, I could barely lift his suit coats when he came home from work because he'd have, uh, always have um, a lot of wilderness built propaganda in the pockets. But he also would have, usually in one pocket, um, like a, a Dante or a Thor or a Blake, you know. Right. And, uh, and a lot of his books had uh, uh, DC Transit bus transfer bookmarks because, <laughs> you know, they didn't have money to ride a cab in those days. Right. So when he went down to the hill or such, he'd take the bus. And uh, so lots of his books uh, had bookmarks that were DC Transit passes. <laughs> in all, it took eight and a half years spanning three presidential administrations, 19 congressional hearings, fierce debates, numerous cross-country trips, 66 revisions to the bill, and a relentless drive that sacrificed his own health to achieve what many observers 
including at times supporters within his own inner orbit, deemed impossible. Yet it is paramount to understand that it wasn't just hard work that brought squabbling parties to the table. Howard Zahnheiser's heartfelt views concerning the connection between wilderness and humanity appealed to our greater sense of purpose as individuals and as a nation. Far from being an us-versus-them proposition, Sonheiser's view that we are not fighting progress, we are making it, and that America must designate and protect wilderness areas in the interest of our greater good, was compelling enough to engender nearly unanimous interagency and congressional support. It is a testament to Howard Sonheiser's perseverance and character that it was so. Howard Zahnheiser went to sleep on May 4, 1964, with the knowledge and contentment that the Wilderness Act was headed for approval. Sometime in the morning hours of May 5th, just four days after testifying at the last of the congressional hearings on the Wilderness Bill, his heart gave out. He was 58 years old. The Washington Post observed that there is a special poignancy to the death of a man on the apparent eve of his attaining a goal for which he had long and devotedly labored. In July 1964, the full House passed the Wilderness Bill by a vote of 374 to 1. On September 3, 1964, President Lyndon Johnson signed the National Wilderness Act into law with Howard Zahnheiser's widow, Alice, looking on. Howard Zahnheiser's efforts to steer the Wilderness Bill to passage is one of the least known and most inspirational stories in American conservation. As biographer Mark Harvey put it, repeatedly buffeted by powerful commodity groups aligned against the Wilderness Bill and deeply discouraged at times by disagreements within the Wilderness Society Council, Zahnheiser refused to give up drawing on his faith in the democratic process and relying on his public relations talents to keep the bill at the forefront of conservation politics. The man, who was once described as not being, quote, a wilderness man, had ensured that we would retain wild places, not just for the creatures who lived in and frequented them, but for the betterment of ourselves. Thank you.